you guys already know I had to come out here and represent the boys with the review of this movie. Today, we're talking about a horror movie named No One Will Save You. Before we get into the review, go to AlienClothing.com. It's the most appropriate clothing brand for a video like this. That's A-Y-Y-L-I-E-N Clothing.com. I'm wearing one of the hoodies right now. We have so much cool shit over there. You're gonna love it. Go check it out. Now, let's talk about this movie, baby. By the way, if it wasn't super obvious, that was ADR. This is what I actually sound like with the mask on. Today we're talking about a horror movie named No One Will Save You. No One Will Save You is almost everything an alien invasion horror should be. It's not perfect, but I loved it a lot. It was written and directed by the same guy who wrote the script for Underwater, which is a cosmic horror movie starring Kristen Stewart. And I really liked that movie. He was also the writer for Love and Monsters, Skull Island, the Babysitter movies, and one of the Divergent movies as well. The only other movie he's listed as the director for on IMDb is a movie called Spontaneous. You know, the teen comedy where kids had spontaneous combust. Very normal stuff. I'm just so glad I didn't explode all over you. Oh my goodness! So it kind of makes sense that his next movie would be an alien horror like this. No One Will Save You stars Caitlin Dever. I loved her in the movie Booksmart, and she's great in this movie as well, which is funny because she hardly utters a single word throughout the movie. If you're mostly stimulated by dialogue in movies, then this might not be the best movie for you. No joke, this movie is 99% grunts, screams, sighs, and any other breath non-verbal way of communicating. But in my opinion, in this movie it works. The lack of dialogue forces Caitlin Dever to communicate entirely through facial expressions and body language. And in doing so, it makes the movie feel more intimate. It forces the viewer to pay attention to the little things. And it also forces the other aspects of the film, like the music and visuals, to do virtually all the heavy lifting. And they deliver in spades. <laughs> This movie doesn't do all that much new with the idea of an alien invasion. If you're a fan of sci-fi, then there's a good chance you've seen some of these tropes before. Big-headed gray aliens with pitch black eyes. They have telepathic abilities and make strange clicking noises to communicate. They use flying saucers that use tractor beams. Their presence affects electricity. All of these aspects of the stereotypical gray alien are present in this movie. So it shares similarities with movies like Signs, Dark Skies, War of the Worlds, and Extraterrestrial. What this movie does to separate it itself is in its intimate execution as it follows a girl who is wrestling with a tragic moment from her past. The aliens in this movie either move extremely slow or in quick bursts, both of which are incredibly unnerving. The story is told entirely through Bryn's perspective as she tries to evade and sometimes even fight these aliens. And my goodness, these big-headed boys have some long-ass fingers. <laughs> They will not have any trouble getting the last chip out of a Pringle can. These big-headed boys also come in various shapes and sizes. You got the traditional variant, the Gollum chimpanzee variant, and the Lanky Kong Slenderman variant. We've got all sorts of homies in this movie. The Slendy guys are pretty neat. They break down into a dance that would probably go viral on TikTok to summon their ship, all without any music, by the way. It's very impressive. The movie starts with Bryn looking at herself in a mirror, practicing a fake smile. This foreshadows an eerie moment later in the movie, when Bryn is faced with her own reflection a second time, but this time with an otherworldly and symbolic twist. The first alien we meet is my boy Bob. This initial encounter with an alien is pretty great, and almost funny at times, because Bob will move slow and methodically, and then suddenly burst into a sprint. His sprint is made up of a bunch of tiny steps, so it builds tension that much better. I'm sorry guys, I couldn't help myself, so here's this scene, but with the Squidward walking sound effect. I'm sorry. <laughs> The house's lights go crazy, the furniture moves on its own, Bob is very polite, and he hangs up the phone after inspecting it. He's just a curious little guy. How can you blame him? To that one friend who has always been there for me in my lowest and my best moments, thank you. I appreciate you. Hey yo, what the fuck?
Bryn narrowly survives this encounter due to a stroke of luck. Get this shit off me! Ah! The music that accompanies this part is great too. The sound effects they use harmoniously accompany Bryn's moments of panic, and I think it works really well. The next day, the alien is lying there dead in her house as she scrambles to try and figure out what to do. At this point in the movie, Brynn has no idea there's about to be a full invasion. She thinks she had a run-in with the only alien, so she tries to prepare herself to face the world after this insane encounter. Right away, things don't feel right. She finds a toppled postman truck. She enters a bus and gets attacked by some people with alien parasites bulging from within their necks. This scene is pretty silly because the parasite only wants Brynn for some reason. In in fact, it pushes some random old guy out of the way that isn't infected to get to Bryn. Maybe because she's younger and a more suitable host or something? Help me! Look at this woman that attacks Bryn on the bus. Bombastic side eye. Criminal offensive. Oh! Eventually, Bryn finds a bunch of people with their arms outstretched towards the sky. I think what I love most about this movie is how realistic Caitlin Dever's acting is. The way she responds to this insane scenario makes the movie feel so authentic and real. I mean, personally, I might talk to myself more if this was happening. You know, saying stuff like, what the fuck? What do I do? What the hell? But the non-verbal nature of this movie was clearly part of the artistic vision. And I think dialogue may have taken away from the experience more than it added. The CGI used for the aliens isn't the best I've seen, but it does the job. I like how we get to see the details in their ink black eyes. It's quite beautiful, actually. Oh my god. Now that is a sexy alien. Fully expecting another attack, Bryn does what she can to try and prepare. She boils a pot of water. Wait, make that two pots. Well, three. Actually, four. Perhaps she saw the movie Signs and thought, Well, what if I made the water really hot? That'd probably be better, right? Our boy Bill drops in to say hi. Bryn won't let him look at an old framed photo of her and her dead best friend. Very rude. Just let our boy take a peek. This was so rude, in fact, that Bill sent his younger brother Timmy after her. Little Timmy is quite the sneaky boy. Look at him sneak up behind Bryn. And he's quite nimble too. But his brain lacks wrinkles. He doesn't seem to be able to use telepathic powers like his big bro. He ain't the most impressive alien. In fact, Bryn bests him with a mop. She stabs him with a mop handle and he's like, oh shit, I'm stuck now. So I think little Timmy could have used more time in the training sim. Then we're introduced to the oldest brother, Lanky Louie. He's just like Bill and Bob, except he's got impressively long limbs. This is the dude they asked to get the wine glasses from the top shelf. Is Louis compensating for something with those long ass limbs? We'll never know. Do any of these aliens have genitalia? Well, they don't need them when they got fingers like that, am I right, guys? Oh, brother! Maybe their dick and balls are locked behind a little shell that opens up between their legs. Maybe they reproduce with binary fission like amoeba. Or maybe they just think each other into existence. That'd be badass. A truly Chad way of reproducing. Lanky Louie ain't the smartest. He kind of falls off the roof of the house by accident. Maybe it's not used to the gravity. And then Louie chases Bryn and gets his ass stuck in a car. And I said Timmy had no wrinkles. Bryn ends up cooking his ass for dinner. Those are some long juicy limbs with a lot of meat. Mm. She'll be set for weeks. You know how cannibals call humans long pork? Because I guess humans taste like pork. What do you think these aliens taste like? Salmon? Eh, probably squid, right? Bill is still hanging out in her house, by the way. He's just chilling. He's looking at the pictures that Bryn had hung up everywhere. Bryn tries a sneak attack, but fails miserably. Literally me when I'm trying to sneak in alien isolation. For some reason, I always get noticed. This part is sick, by the way. With a flick of the wrist, Bryn goes flying. Bill is on his Magneto shit right now. He ate this scene up. Isn't that what the kids are saying nowadays? When someone's eating something, that means they're doing it well, right? Bryn is kind of a menace, and she's kind of annoying the aliens. So it's time to bring out the red light of paralysis. I love this part. The use of the lighting and the cinematography make this scene truly haunting. Bill slowly moves towards her, and then last night's dinner doesn't treat him so well. Just kidding, he's throwing up a parasite. 
eyesight. It floats towards Bryn's mouth, and it's one of those scenes that makes you feel very uncomfortable, almost violated. Bill forces her mouth open by opening his own mouth. Open the docking bay, here comes the plane, Bryn. Bryn wakes up and it was all a dream. Roll credits. So yeah, not the best ending, I would say. It could have been better. JK, you just got bamboozled! Bryn gets a vision of what her friend would have looked like if she had reached adulthood. She serves as a reminder to Bryn that she's dreaming, so she jams her hand into her throat and takes out the parasite. <gasps> I think it's very cute this no waste policy the aliens have. Whenever one of their own dies, a ship comes out of nowhere and sucks them up. Different color lights from these UFOs means they serve a different purpose. The red light makes you stop moving, but this time the light is yellow. The parasite that Bryn removed had copied her DNA. The UFO that arrived creates a copy of her. It's kind of weird that this copy isn't naked, right? Well, whatever, it's alien tech, you guys wouldn't get it. Bryn had carried the box cutter with her this entire time. She decided decides to use it now against her clone, after the clone stabs her with a stick. Gotcha, bitch! Ooh. Why didn't Bren use the box cutter on Timmy or Louie earlier? Maybe she forgot she had it. I mean, she was panicking after all. I love this scene, by the way, because during this scene, Bren is literally forced to face herself. Face the person that caused the death of her best friend when she was younger. It's a surprisingly clever and poignant scene. In the next scene, Louie's brother Dewey pop locks and drops it to send Bryn into a UFO, where she meets the rest of his family. All the homies come out of the darkness, and they E.T. phone home her dome to view her memories. As they do this, Bryn is reliving these experiences. She's forced to revisit these traumatic moments in her life. We learn that Bryn had whacked her best friend Maude with a rock when they were kids during a fight, which ended up killing her. At this point, earlier scenes in the movie start to make a whole lot of sense. There was a part when Bryn visited Maude's grave, and there was also a scene when Maude's mother spat on her when they ran into one another. During this scene, the aliens learn of love, friendship, heartbreak, and empathy through Bryn's lived trauma. After deliberating, the aliens ask the mothership what they're to do with her. I guess the UFOs are also living beings. The aliens end up sending Bryn back to Earth, and then they start a disco party in the sky or some shit, I don't know. Let's get this party going. And then Bryn starts to laugh. Maybe they're healing her internal wounds. Maybe they're taking over her mind. This part is open to interpretation. I like to think that the alien homies were releasing her from her trauma, as well as healing her wounds, allowing her to live happily. Because for most of her life, she's been weighed down by this one event. She's been filled with regret and depression ever since then. And she would not stop fighting for her life despite that, because she knows deep down that Maude would want her to live, which might also help explain that vision that she had with adult Maude earlier. In the next scene, Bryn puts on her best midsummer garb and is all smiles. Her neck appears to be free of any parasite, but she's living with people that are current hosts of parasites like it's normal. Which is kind of weird, but okay. The aliens like Bryn, so they have some of their human puppets act as a bunch of housekeepers for Bryn's place. Earlier in the movie, these humans were dicks to Bryn before. Like one guy she waved hi to, but he didn't respond to her. Everybody that Bryn encountered was very, very rude to her. But now that the aliens have control of them, they couldn't be nicer. Thank you, alien homies. Very cool. So all's good in the world now. Pretty hilarious and unexpected ending, I have to admit. I kind of respect it though. They didn't go the obvious path of revealing that Bryn had never actually pulled the parasite out, either that or leaving Bryn to watch as the world burns around her. This complete tonal shift was a breath of fresh air in this genre. Everything changes at the end. The color grading, the music, everything. It's like the movie is telling the viewer that the one thing keeping people depressed and angry is free will. So in a way, it's still a very dark ending, despite its outward appearance. We get a pan to the sky, where UFOs fly freely, leading the viewer to believe that the aliens had completely taken over the planet. And Bryn is either strangely okay with this, and is enjoying her new life, or her mind has been manipulated somehow by the aliens. I think her mind has been changed by the aliens, maybe because they feel bad for her, they respect that she wants to live so bad, I don't know. What's very obvious is that they had a significant impact on her mental health. And you kinda have to ask yourself, would it be so bad if there was an alien invasion? If all the assholes had their minds taken over? I don't know, man. Might be a better life. Alright guys, that's gonna do it for this review. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Can you even understand what I'm saying when I wear this mask? <laughs>
if you're scrolling up the screen right now, that means you support this channel and I love you. You can join them by going to patreon.com slash Elvis the Alien. Don't forget to check out the coolest clothing brand on Earth, Alien Clothing. That's A-Y-Y-L-I-E-N clothing dot com. Go check it out. You'll love what you see over there. And yeah. I think that's gonna do it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, do all that stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Toodaloo! Ah!